This is a big one. I kind of think that this is the one. If there is one thing holding us back, one thing that is dragging us down from learning and improving, it's feeling stupid. Feeling stupid is at the end of almost every behavior that stops us from learning. Once you whittle down all the reasons and excuses to their core, this is the thing stopping us from learning better, learning more, and enjoying ourselves while doing it. And people tend to think that feeling stupid is kind of its own thing, something we're thinking about ourselves that just happens alongside us as we experience our successes and failures. But feeling stupid is never isolated from the rest of our experience. If you're feeling stupid, that is louder than anything else that's going on. And in many cases, it tugs on you and it tugs on you until it becomes the dominant thing we're reacting to. Because feeling stupid is not just a frivolous side hustle our brain happens to go through when we're feeling things. Feeling stupid has an agenda. And that agenda is to get you to quit. Because thinking you're stupid always comes with this secondary logic, which is if we're stupid, and that's truly the explanation for why we're not understanding whatever it is, then we can't improve, we won't improve, and it wouldn't matter if we kept trying anyway because we're inherently stupid. So then what happens? Well, if feeling stupid wins out, we give up and we quit. And maybe that just means closing the book after looking at a practice problem and knowing that you didn't have a clue about how to get the answer. Or maybe that means walking away from entire subjects, schools, careers, hobbies, or even locations or groups of people you know, because we just don't feel like we're good enough. So why did I make this video? I made this video because after having a lifetime all oriented around academic achievement and learning strategies, I went from thinking like most people do, there are some lucky smart people, some unlucky dumb people, and then a bunch of people in between, to thinking that those categorizations are literally useless because the only things that determine success are a combination of early childhood experience, willingness to grind, and pure dumb luck at how good you are at something the very first time you try it. Not how good you're going to be at it eventually, but pure dumb luck on that very first time. No stupid people, you say. Well, you haven't met my blank. Sure. People are horrible. People act stupid all the time. People are annoying. People don't listen. People make bad decisions without thinking about them. And people try to learn things really hard for a long time and fail. And with all of these true things, how could there not be stupid people? Well, I think about stupidness in terms of can a given person learn a certain something if they're actively trying to? And the way that I've encountered people feeling stupid the most is students that I've had truly believing there was nothing they could do to learn chemistry, that they were just too stupid. And these were students that were trying and wanted to succeed, but at the same time, they really believed that they were just too stupid to ever actually get it. And that's the stupid that I don't believe exists. I believe that if it were everyone's life goal to pass one chemistry class, to pass a bunch, to get a PhD in chemistry, they could do it. I've seen so many people who were completely failed by their early education, who have essentially no understanding of any math or science, grind hard enough to get good grades in my classes. And after so many years of teaching, so many years of seeing students defy what I thought was going to happen again and again, I literally had to break down my pre-existing thoughts. I had no desire or intention to change the way I thought about these things. I didn't go into teaching thinking that just the act of feeling stupid was a huge hindrance to learning. My opinions just slowly changed after hundreds and thousands of student interactions. So let's start with how I was raised to believe in intelligence, which I think is pretty typical. You're in school, you end up taking a variety of tests, and you start to get feedback. 
And at this point, you're just a little kid and your identity consists of a bunch of things that you had no control or say over, like where you live, what you look like, what your family is like. And these first individual reactions that we get from people outside our family unit are extremely informative. You might go from being just a five-year-old to being the five-year-old that got the nicest compliments out of the whole class on their finger painting, but came in last in the foot race. Now, all of a sudden, you're a five-year-old with data points. For some of the first times ever, you've been given direct feedback by peers and non-family adults, and it doesn't matter that there weren't any actual grades or consequences. You were still smart enough to tell when others were impressed with you or disappointed in you, and that sears into your memory. These details essentially leveled up your identity, which is really exciting and feels important. You're learning what it's like out there in the world and learning what types of responses you'll be getting from people. Now you're not just a five-year-old, you're a five-year-old that's good at art and bad at running. And these early memories are really powerful. I'm sure you guys can think back to some early victories and defeats you had that felt really important and distinct. The running and the painting are real examples from when I was that young. And then there's just this weird snowball effect and you'll start to hear people say things like, Robin is so good at drawing, wow. Or the next time there is a drawing assignment, everyone eagerly asks, oh, what are you gonna draw? And you can tell that they're impressed or genuinely curious. And then the flip side happens where I was picked last or almost last consistently in anything athletic. And you hear those same people being curious and genuinely impressed about someone else's sports abilities. And you realize like, oh, I guess in this arena of life, I'm not such hot shit. And then what happens? Well, we're all lazy, egotistical, barely evolved apes. We love attention. It's great to be accepted and it's scary to not be accepted. So we gravitate towards the things we can do well with relatively low effort. Plus, we're usually given explicit and enthusiastic encouragement by the adults in our lives to continue doing the things they see us succeeding in. And the things we don't do well? Well, why do I wanna do something where people aren't telling you that I'm great? You know, why would I want to do something where I never get compliments or the compliments are kind of condescending like, oh, good try. Like that fucking sucks. So we snowball and we snowball and we age and the original painting and foot race blend into nothing as our brain grows and memories start to delete themselves. Our identities become even more complex. And by the time you're in middle or high school, you just fully believe the statement, I'm good at art and bad at sports. These statements seem written in stone, like irrefutable facts about yourself that would have been true no matter how you lived your life. They don't seem like a result of some initial luck, a reflection of our interests, and the fact that years of input from others controlled our self-esteem and life choices. And this would all be fine if the only skills we ever had to gain were things we were naturally inclined to do. If life was nothing but freedom and endless options and there was enough room and space to just do the things that you happened to be good at the first time you tried them, if we only had to do the things that we were better than average at, then there'd be no problem. But you know, surprise, it's not how life works. Obviously in school for a good long while, we're all required to take the same subjects regardless of how interested we are in them. And once we're in the workforce, there are some very real and long lasting consequences to being able to gain some skills versus others. Painting and running are two things that usually aren't tied to money, so it's kind of irrelevant that I was good at one and bad at the other. But what about a kid who feels good at writing essays and bad at math? If you believe that you are inherently bad at math, then immediately a huge section of careers are cut off from you. And the careers that involve math trend towards being pretty well paid. So I think it's a shame that so many kids believe that their math ability is this ingrained, irrefutable skill that you're either born with or not. It's this misunderstanding that stops kids from even checking in with themselves about what they're interested in outside of the things they already think they're good at, or to set goals outside their comfort zone because they believe that since they're just not good at certain things, it doesn't even matter if you'd like to do them or not. That it doesn't even matter if we had a hope and a dream of getting a job that uses math because it's just not gonna happen for us. And when we feel stupid, we feel the pain and resignment of a lifetime of thinking this way. When you're looking at a grade you're not proud of, you can probably feel your entire life cascading back onto you all the years of comparing yourself to others that just got it. All the times you've felt this disappointment before. So 
what do you do if you feel stupid? I think you need to update your definition of how learning works. Stupid means something inherent inside ourselves, without hope, preordained. Stupid is a death sentence. But what if instead of being stupid, you're just bad at something? Being bad at something is very common and very overcomable. Being bad at something is just another way of saying you haven't dedicated enough skill building hours to be good at it yet. That's not a death sentence, it's just a work sentence. So let's zoom back to the paintings in kindergarten and let's say there was a kid who painted a bad picture, something that got a couple of condescending compliments and that's it. Looking at his painting next to mine and the reaction mine was getting versus his, he's thinking he's just bad at art. What he doesn't know as a random five-year-old is that my mom is a professional artist and that I've been getting lessons in art every day because after school, she's still working on her art and she sets me up with my own art project at the same table. They're not formal lessons and the only reason I'm getting an art project too is so that I sit right there and bother her less than if I was free to do whatever, but I'm still watching a professional work. The house I live with is filled with her art, so even just existing in my house is a subconscious reminder of what interesting and good art looks like. And she's giving me a couple of age appropriate tips a day. And now that you've heard that part of the story, do you still think I was just inherently good at paintings? Or do you think that it's more likely that I just had way more practice than any other five-year-old in my class? My early childhood experience couldn't have set me up more for painting, and I already had hours and hours of grinding done by the time I was five. Still, what about looking at all the paintings next to each other? Most of those kids didn't have a parent who was a professional artist, and there will still be you know, variation in painting quality amongst five-year-olds who all have roughly the same experience. That's where, yes, random luck on how good you are at something the very first time you try it is a thing, but people vastly overestimate how important and long lasting that is. The day all the babies in my kindergarten class were born, statistically, I was probably not going to become the best five-year-old at painting in terms of raw artistic talent, yet I had already overcome every five-year-old in my class with the grinding that I was doing nightly at home. Yes, my mom was an artist, so how can I say I wasn't just born with the artist gene? You know, there's no way to say for sure. I'm not going to sit here and claim that I know how every fold of the brain works, but back to my early successes and defeats, my dad is also a runner. He ran a ton of marathons, top of his class in track and field, but that didn't stop me from coming in last in the race at school because I didn't get any running and grinding hours with him. And if you took any group of kindergartners, picked the one that drew the worst painting that day, and then for a week gave that kindergartner age appropriate tips and had them draw two drawings a day, at the end of that week, they would have one of the best paintings in the class. At that age, it's really just a couple extra hours of grinding that can have you ahead of everyone else. Because practicing skills is 99% of learning something versus any inherent advantage you had the very first time you did something. But you know, essentially no children are aware of this fact about learning and very quickly the hours of grinding and the early childhood experience that everyone's gaining really start to stack. Even though I may have gotten the most compliments on my painting, it still looked pretty similar to the other five-year-old's paintings. However, if you take a group of high schoolers and have them all draw something, the range in quality will be vast, much bigger than the kindergartners. And it will look vast because some people will have done the skill set earning grinding hours and some won't have. And we might have some loose awareness of this, but most people will still interpret it as some of the high schoolers are just good at art. Okay, so once again, let's transfer that to feeling inherently bad at math. Let's say that's burbling up for someone as math starts to get more complex around sixth grade. Just like the high schoolers' drawings, by the time you have 36th graders take a math test, the top scorer and the low scorer are way more than a week of loose catch-up apart. And even though the kids may only be 11 or 12 years old, that's enough time to have created a basic math foundation. So the kids that got it and got it well are going to way outscore the kids that didn't. And even if you've had all the same teachers the whole way through, there's so much more to early childhood experience than just having teachers in elementary school. Having a parent who's able to explain math to you versus not having one, having a caretaker who didn't know math but generally held you accountable for doing your homework versus not having one can make a world of difference. And you never know what's going on behind the scenes. 
I was unstoppable during middle and high school math. I was a force to reckon with and no test could hold me down. And since I was six years old, I was sent to Kumon and did extra math every single day of my childhood. There's just no competing with someone who has done 30 minutes extra of math every single day of their existence when you haven't. Like seriously, think about that. My extra math experience by sixth grade was 365 times 30 times five equals 54,750 minutes or 912 hours. That's a lot of grinding hours all on top of what I was already being taught in school. So if you're looking out onto the landscape as that sixth grader who didn't do very well on their last math test, it can be super demoralizing. It can feel impossible to catch up. It can feel lots of bad things, but it still doesn't mean that you're stupid and it still doesn't mean that you just can't catch up. All it means is that you have a different combination of early childhood experience and grinding than the people who did well. And the work you'd have to do to catch up might be unpleasant and it might be long and it might feel impossible, but it's not. And it's not written in stone when you're 12 or 18 that careers that involve math and science are just permanently off your options list. And that's the message that I feel like needs to be out there with students and just does not get voiced in any real way in our current educational system. Because when you look at it this way, the kid who just passed the math test but didn't go to Kumon or get parent help is way more impressive than me who got first because of my huge advantage. But that's not the way our society works and that's not how adults give reinforcement. You're just in school, the tests get handed back and kids feel good or bad about themselves. So what's to be done? Well, if you're pretty much on board with the fact that you are not stupid at whatever you're bad at, you're just bad at it, and that being bad at something can be changed through tedious, painful grinding hours, then all we have to learn how to do is to grind and to commit ourselves to it. And here's where we get meta, because learning how to grind at a skill is, of course, its own skill that you can be good or bad at. But unlike all the other skills, if you can learn how to grind and learn a new skill, then you can learn any skill you want. And don't get me wrong, grinding is terrible. Grinding sucks. Grinding is a commitment. And to learn some of these skills, it's a huge commitment. Remember how I already had 912 hours of extra math grinding by sixth grade? That means a sixth grader who didn't get that math grinding would have to work 23 40 hour weeks to catch up. So for half a year, January to June, that sixth grader would have to come in at 9 a.m., leave at five, and grind at math the entire time. And if you kind of visualize a sixth grader doing that, doing nothing but pouring themselves into math for six months, no soccer, no fun, just working a full-time math job, after all that, wouldn't you pretty much imagine that any sixth grader would do pretty well on a sixth grade math test? And another word on grinding, not all grinding is created equal. You really have to grind like you mean it, and then you have to actually mean it. Sitting at a desk, getting everything just right, and then reading through a textbook chapter doesn't count for anything if you didn't understand anything the chapter said. Part of grinding is reading through that first paragraph and catching yourself going, oh wait, my eyes moved from line to line, but I don't know what the fuck that was trying to say, and then reading it a second and a third time. And just because you've read one paragraph three times, that still doesn't guarantee anything. I've read countless textbook paragraphs three times very slowly, only to be just as confused as I was in the beginning. Then it's up to you to switch the grinding into resource collection mode, check your notes, watch YouTube videos, look up words you don't know, and read the paragraph again to see if you understand it a little bit more. I guess I won't say that my math background was just handed to me, but the opportunity to get one certainly was handed to me because of my parents' decision to send me to Kumon. Not sponsored by Kumon, by the way, <laughs> just is how I learned math. There were other kids that went to Kumon for just as long as I did and didn't achieve the towering accomplishment of biggest math nerd in math class, but they didn't dive headfirst into the grinding like I did. Those 912 hours will drift away to the sea and get you nothing if you're rolling your eyes, not listening and dragging your feet, and generally not trying. And that makes grinding even more miserable and harder to do properly because your attitude really has to be there. You have to be the driving force. You have to know you want something and continually renew your efforts to keep trying in the face of so much work and so many truly boring, terrible hours. 
And back to our sixth grader who wants to catch up on their math background. We know that no sixth graders are going to be able to get six months off the rest of their lives to just drill math. So if you haven't gotten the early childhood grinding that you want, your first chance to catch up is really late high school and into college when you're missing even more hours than the kids that had it handed to them. By the time you graduate high school, you're now 2,190 hours behind your peers that had the same privilege as I did, or an entire year of 40 hour work weeks behind them. This is obviously an annoying and terrible feeling if you want to catch up, but you don't, you know, just have a random year and all the resources you need to do it. But unlike being stupid, it isn't a death sentence. It's not impossible. And I've known a ton of people that have done this. They've overcome their lack of a foundation, found ways to eke out the time and are now literally doctors or whatever else they were trying to become. So if you feel stupid, don't feel stupid. Feel mad, mad that you were robbed of the early childhood experience that would have made you great at what you want to be great at now. If you feel stupid, don't feel stupid. Feel hopeful, hopeful that if you want something bad enough, you aren't just blocked from it because of the random luck of the universe and that you can break free of that block. It might just feel like digging through concrete with a spoon. If you feel stupid, don't feel stupid, Feel determined, determined to learn, determined to not give up, determined to find the room in your schedule and the resources that will unlock your understanding because they are out there. And whether or not you choose to pursue them, you're still not stupid and you never have been.